Hello everyone. I'm working on a gypsy journal for this video and I wanted to show you how to take a regular book. I picked this one up at Dollar Tree and turn it into your cover and basically the outside of your junk journal. So the first thing I'm going to do is take off the jacket and sometimes you're lucky enough and the jacket has designs on it that you can use. And a lot of times I'll go to the library for books as well to find vintage books. Goodwill is another place and when you find books that have vintage images or even kind of yellowed pages inside that's just a, a bonus because you can always use those for your journal. For this particular book, it's a newer title, Three Moments of an Explosion. I'm not even sure really what the book is, but I've been buying larger sizes because what I'm finding is that if I go by kind of eyeballing it when I get into the store, a lot of times I'll get home and the junk journal turns out really chunky and you'll end up with a cover that's not big enough to hold the insides of your journal. So for instance, from the binding to the edge here is six inches and the edge is nine and a half. And generally when we're working with eight and a half by 11 inch paper folded in half, it will fit very well in a book this size. Smaller books again are just gonna um, possibly be too too small for your needs so it's a good idea to just bring a ruler along if you're gonna go book shopping. So for this one the first thing I usually do after taking off the jacket is I just look inside here at what the pages look like and they're always a little bit different sometimes there is this inside kind of um, it's not a title page but there might be a page or two that's just plain white or cream paper sometimes you have to take that out and sometimes you don't sometimes you can leave it in and have it be part of the journal for this one because of the way it's bound I'm actually going to be taking out everything you see that's sewn in here. So hopefully that's clear on camera. So you could use an X-Acto knife. I like to use a box cutter, which is a little bit heavier duty than like a typical kind of skinny X-Acto knife. So here's my box cutter. These come a little thicker too, but this will work fine. It's got a really good sturdy foundation that you can hold on to and of course you always want to be careful when you're using these open blades like this. I'm just going to make a little incision right here and then again at the back and sometimes what you can do is just run all the way down. It really depends on the book itself and you, this will help you I'm just going to close this so that it's not a blade just sitting out. And then you just start to kind of move this back and forth. Now the thing that I have done before that really stinks when it happens is that if you pull too hard, the binding will actually split along here and when it splits there, You'll, you'll have to do a lot more to get this bound back in, in a way that keeps your journal sturdy. So I try to avoid that as much as I can. It has happened before though, so just be aware. It is fixable, but it's definitely better if that doesn't happen. So I'm almost using sort of a rocking motion, going back and forth and pulling like so, and then you'll start to see the binding inside. And there's usually kind of like a little mesh, um, plastic stuff in there. 
and I'm just gonna hang on to the binding as I tear away so that hopefully it will not tear the binding itself. And if you haven't done this before, gutted a book, so, so to speak, it's a little bit, uh, it takes some getting used to because, you know, we're, we're taught from a very early age to not do this to books, and it does, it's, you know, just think of it as the book is going to be transformed. Um, I'm used to doing it now, but at first it was almost like sacrilege, because I'm a big book reader, and, you know, there's certain rules you're supposed to follow where books are concerned. So you'll probably have some little hanger-ons here, and it's up to you really if you want to um, tear these out. The thicker ones you definitely do, like something like this, it's a good idea to go ahead and tear it out, because you want this to be as seamless as possible. And then down here at the end, you can see where the, the sewing is, and there's some heavy-duty kind of ribbon right here. And if you can preserve that, it's nice because it will peek out of your journal once you have everything in there. And it just gives a nice kind of finished look when you have the sewing in there. So now I'm just going to turn the book right side out again and kind of take a look at the binding make sure that it stayed intact and something you can do if it does tear it can tear at this point when you take the pages out and it can also tear when you're working with it when you're altering it so if it does tear there are different heavy-duty glues you can use what I usually use is duct tape just because the duct tape will roughly fit the size of the binding plus a little extra on either edge and you can run it along the side like this and then um, burnish the inside of the duct tape in here and it will provide a really sturdy binding just in case it does tear and you can do that even if the binding stays intact just for a little bit of extra uh, security that it will not tear uh, once your journal goes to its home. So the next thing I like to do is use acrylic gesso to paint the outside covers of the book and acrylic gesso just acts as a paint primer. It'll also help to make your book more sturdy and paint will cling to it better. So when you think about primer that goes on a car, this is similar for painting on any type of mixed media surface or anytime you're going to be using acrylic paints. So I'm just gonna open up my big jar of gesso and I make sure to give it a good shake because it is, um, acrylic is basically plastic and little bits will sort of settle into the plastic over time and it's always good to shake it up a little bit because uh, some of the paint can or gesso can separate so i'm just going to take a nice big wide wide flat paintbrush and just go up and down And just like I mentioned, those little bits, sometimes you'll get in your paints too, in acrylic paint, you might get some little, little um, bitty pieces of plastic, basically. So you just want to try and smooth those out, get them off of where you're uh, smoothing your gesso onto, so it doesn't give a bumpy look to your book. And you can go as thick or thin with the gesso as you like. I tend to go pretty thick because, again, it's, uh, it's going to help my book be sturdier. It's going to help the binding stay together. 
and it's going to make the acrylic paint that goes on top or any other types of spray inks or media that you put on there <clears throat> more archival so your junk journal will last longer. And with gesso, if you heat set it with a heat tool, it may bubble. Same with acrylic paint. So that can be a look that you might want in mixed media. However, on your book, you probably don't want a bunch of bubbly paint on the front unless you're going for a textured cover, which in that case, the heat tool can work. But what I like to do like I do with a lot of junk journaling, anytime I use pastes, glues, anything that I need to dry fast but I don't want to heat set it is I just set it in front of a fan. And that means cool air will go onto it. It's not going to react. The uh, whatever medium it is that you're drying is not going to react to that cool air and it'll just make for a much nicer, smoother appearance. And it won't take this long at all to dry in front of a fan. And then we can go on to the next step. Okay, so now that the gesso is dried, I'm gonna start applying my paint. And in order to do this, if you like the way that the inside covers look and you don't want them to get mucked up with the paint that you're gonna be using on the outside covers, see how this is a nice off-white? Okay, so first I'm going to put down a layer of black paint, and I'm going to use a fairly thick one. This is an impasto paint. Uh, you can use really any type of acrylic paint, craft paint. You might have to do um, a second or third coat even to get, you know, a, a nice even look. Just going to put a nice amount of paint out and got another nice big flat brush and just gonna go in that same up and down motion And since we were careful to put down the gesso nice and smoothly, making sure there weren't little, little blips and blops on there, the craft paint or black paint will go on smoothly. And if you get pet hair or any little flyaways or just, you know, whatever will usually get on your book, which can be just about anything that's flying around in the air, uh, you can maintain a really nice, smooth look on the front here and it just it, it just gets easier with practice like anything where you'll get better results each time and it's taken me making several journals to really get a good technique down for creating a cover So as you can see, because this paint is a thicker paint, I probably will just need the one coat. If this were a thinner craft paint, I'd at least need two because there, there will be gaps and you won't really be able to tell until the paint is completely dry whether or not you have little spots of white peeking through. And just to get this a little more even, I'm going to spread the paint right on down the book. And I'm working on a glass mat, but if you're working on a non-stick mat, 
that'll really help you in terms of cleanup. The glass mat is good for the paint too. Uh, I just, I tend to clean up almost right away when I'm using the paint or gesso on the glass mat because it just gets harder and harder to clean it off the longer you leave it. Get some more paint in my little palette here. So I definitely recommend PaintWise. Uh, if you are near a big box store like Michael's, Joann's, Hobby Lobby, I know AC Moore is more sort of on the east coast. Um, if you have access to Walmart, I believe Walmart carries the Folk Art brand. I know that they carry the Apple Barrel brand. You can stock up on craft paints, especially if they're running a sale, pretty cheaply. And uh, one of my favorite, personal favorites to work with, and they sell it at Hobby Lobby and Joann's, I, I've never seen it at Michael's, is Ceram Coat. That's a really good one. And it's not super expensive as long as you um, find it on sale, even not on sale. I mean, it really depends on how much you want to spend and how many different colors you want. But I'll just show you really quickly. I picked up this one. This. So I was just talking briefly about the ceram coat when it cut off. It's not at the Michaels, at least in Arizona, but this is a good one. This is a thicker craft paint. I recently stocked up. Uh, they were four for five dollars, so I got eight. The one thing with acrylic paint, and this goes for um, the less expensive all the way up to the more expensive acrylics, they do go bad, so definitely use up what you buy. Um, you might even notice sometimes when you go into the store that you'll see some that are already starting to separate, kind of like nail polish does, and the, the way you can tell if your acrylic paint has gone bad is it'll get a funky smell, so you'll definitely know. So it's good, you know, and it depends on a lot of factors. It depends on how old it was when it was put on the shelf, and it also depends on how many times you've opened the bottle, so, and where you live, you know, the climate. Uh, but those are some recommendations as far as craft paint go, and then, of course, you can go all the way up to, like, Golden and Liquitex paints that are going to... The Basics Liquitex brand is a less expensive uh, acrylic in the Liquitex line and I have used it some. I tend to use more matte paints, especially in junk journaling. Um, they're easier to layer over and the lack of gloss just kind of gives it more of an older effect. So remember I told you once it dries you'll be able to see where you've missed and definitely along the binding on this side, for whatever reason, I did a pretty bad job of painting right here. So there's quite a few skips in here. So I'm just going to go over those quickly with the black paint and get that dry. Just kind of eye, eye it and see if there are any other spots I might have missed. And the binding and edges. 
all the corners are going to get the most use. So I'm going to make sure that there's plenty of paint where it's most going to be handled. And I did go around these edges off camera to make sure that they were not white. So you'll get a nice seamless look that way. I'm just gonna go back over them again to make sure I haven't missed anything. Sometimes the edges and corners have a little bit of texture to them with however the book was wrapped and so there can be little gaps in there. So just kind of run your paintbrush along these edges and especially in the corners right in here. Now I mentioned earlier that if you had wanted to preserve these inside covers to wrap it with wax paper and go around with either painter's tape, something low tack, washi tape will work too. I'm going to do something a little different with these covers, so I chose not to do that this time, but I definitely recommend that if you don't want to get your outside paint on the inside. So I'm just going to put this in front of the fan again to dry. So while I'm waiting for that layer to dry, I wanted to show you a quick little fun technique. Sometimes you'll get embellishments that are ready-made like this. They'll come in a kit. These were ordered off of AliExpress. and they have white backgrounds, so you can coffee dye these. You can adhere them to scrapbook paper, like I've shown you in previous videos. But what I'm going to do in this case, since I don't want to lose these really pretty, vibrant fronts, I took out their little hole punches and I just go around to make sure they don't have little bits of paper kind of hang, hanging off if they've been punched out of something or if they um, came out of one of the larger kits where you have a bunch of die cuts on one big sheet. And I'm just going to use some spray ink. So this is some Lindy Stamp Gang. This is Moon Shadow Mist. I'm not going to shake it because it has a bright green mica powder in it and I really just want this brown so you kind of hold your uh, mister at a slight angle and just get a good amount of ink on there and you might as well do it on a doily or something that you want inked because you can use all of the ink that is left over to color something else. So that's just a quick little tip while we're waiting for that cover to dry. Okay, so now this is dry and I'm going to use this ceram coat color called Barn Red. It's a deep red. And what I want to do is have the black background stay and show through, but I'm going to brush on the barn door or Barn Red. So here's that color, and I'm going to give my paintbrush a good cleaning here, and I'll just get it good and paint it up. And then I want to take off some excess so that I don't put too much of the barn door down. And then with a really light hand, you want to just go back and forth again. And you want to kind of think about how a book would naturally age. So 
around these nooks and crannies right here, more than likely the black undercoat, so to speak, is going to remain darker in those crevices. So I'm just gonna lightly kind of brush in there, but I'm not gonna worry too much about the red getting in there too much. I just don't want it to be completely black in there. And just load up the paint again, then brush off and then go again. And you wanna go end to end with your strokes because if you have one that stops right here, it's gonna be harder to make that look uh, seamless. Like for instance, where it stops right here, while it's still wet, you wanna grab it and make sure that you go all the way through with your brush stroke. And I'm just going to hold this very lightly right here to kind of brace the book and so it doesn't run around too much on me and get the rest of my red paint on there. So you can see how quickly you can get uh, a two-toned effect. Now this looks a little bit curved in the brush strokes here, so I'm just going to go back over it and go as straight as I can. But really, it's hard to make a mistake at this point because you know, you're looking for something that looks uh, not perfect, you know, it's, it's, it's an old book, it's supposed to look like an old book, so it's going to have some of its, uh, its own personality. And I like to leave the, the binding a little bit darker, that's just my preference, and also if there is a title that's engraved here and it's not one that goes along with your theme, the more gesso and paint that goes over this area, you'll really only be able to see kind of a light uh, impression of those letters. So really depends. Sometimes you'll find a cool vintage book that has a title that really works with your theme. In this case, you know, I, I don't really want that lettering to show, but I don't mind if a little bit of it shows because it just adds to the character. So I'm going to pop this in front of the fan again. So for the front cover, I'm going to do a collage. And this is an image from one of my journal kits. It's called The Mystic, in case you want to look it up. And I printed it on cream cardstock, 65 pounds, so it's a good, good weight. When you're adhering collage pieces, especially on the front, you don't want it to warp with any of your glues or anything that you're going to be using. So it's good to use a, a card stock instead of like a copy paper weight. And I first just, this is called a rough cut, so I roughly cut it out the shape and now I'm going to fussy cut. And I've shown this in a previous video, but in order to get around curves well, instead of moving your scissors, you want to move the paper. So like around her elbow, I'm moving the paper and letting the scissors close. That's a much better way than if you're trying to um, move the scissors. And now there's some really detailed cutting uh, through her headdress. So I'm just going to be really careful around these little edges and if you have a good high-powered lamp that's always good to see all these little details. 
it can be hard to see when you're getting in these tiny little parts. Pretty tricky right in there since there's a round part of her uh, her head dress. So I'm just gonna keep going around it. And I'm just gonna be careful to not overcut. I'm gonna leave the little feather looking things for now and just go around like this. And another thing to remember when you have little delicate parts that are sticking out when you're fussy cutting is to hold on to a big part of your shape of your paper. So like right here, if I'm holding on here, it's more likely to tear. So I'm gonna grab onto this while I'm going around the moon. And these are just little tips I have learned the hard way. And especially prints that have light and shadow in them you want to cut very carefully so the light and shadow like the light around her arm and the shadow on her underarm will still show so again moving the paper will be your best bet for preserving the image as best you can Okay, now I'm just looking for little edges that are pointy or kind of sticking out as looking not quite right. And now I'm going to go in and do the feathers. And I'm holding right here where it splits. And so you can cut up along one side and then meet along the other side. Okay, so we'll be able to feather these out if we'd like to, to add a little bit of dimension. And then areas that you want to cut away that are on the inside of your cutting, I would go back in with either your X-Acto knife, you could even use a hole punch if it's a large enough space to hole punch in there. I do like to use a little cutter because a lot of times the hole punch, it, it's not going to make a big enough cut in there for you to get in there without wrinkling the paper up. Okay, so of course you can use an X-Acto knife. I'm going to cut a big enough area in here. 
but not too close to the edges because I don't want to cut into her face or arm. So that'll give us a good amount of space to work with. Now around her face, I'm gonna be very careful. She has a lot of light on her face, it's so pretty. And I don't wanna lose any of that. And if you have little mini snippers, those would work even better in this situation. I'll leave that for a second. I'm just going to go around the moon now. Okay, so there is a little tidbit right there and a little tiny bit right around her face that I've left here. I'm just going to carefully cut that. And if you have those tiny little sewing scissors or uh, the Tonic brand has a smaller version of this. I think that would work even better. So <clears throat> I'll go ahead and cut this part out as well, but we have our basic focal point for our collage. So these are the basic elements I'm going to be using for the collage. Now this little clip art, the little gypsy caravan, I just went ahead and fussy cut this out. Then of course I have her. This is a cutout from a magazine that I thought would be a nice contrast to these oranges and pinks with the blues and purples and greens in the background. So when you're choosing collage pieces, it's always nice to have something contrasting so that your focal image will really pop. And then I have some vellum paper that I'm going to be using in the background and found this at Hobby Lobby. It has kind of a marbled look and it is a little bit wrinkly so I'm going to need to work with that and then I have a piece of file folder here and you can use um, cardstock as well. So I'm going to get my book.